Good day to all of you. This is Vicente. And for this session, we will have a webinar, the first of many during the entire semester, all within the course, which is EDUC 7100, Debates in Educational Leadership. For this particular webinar, I'll be focusing on a general introduction of the course. So I'll be talking about three very important things the design principles, how our course has been designed, the structure of the course, and also the assessment tasks that are important for the course. So these are the three things that I'll be talking about in this webinar. Before I continue, let's take a look at this short quotation from Bill Gates. And let's do a bit of reflection. Once you read this sentence, there are many interpretations that you can derive from it. I'd like to call your attention to two. First is the idea that leadership should be forward-looking. Second, that leadership should be outward-looking. Forward-looking because it looks at, in the words of Bill Gates, the next century and outward looking because we're not looking at the leadership principle or the leader as a person, but we're actually taking a look at how a person who aspires to be a leader can influence others. In the words of Bill Gates, can empower others. So these two thrusts of leadership is something that resonates very clearly with the way that our particular course, this one, Debates in Educational Leadership, is structured. Let's take a look at the design principles. There are only four main design principles. The first is the flipped classroom model. In the 13 weeks that we have in the semester, we will only have four or five face-to-face -face lectures. The rest will be webinars. This is in keeping with the principle of a flipped classroom. I think most of you are familiar with what the flipped classroom model is. Essentially, the traditional classroom can be defined as teacher teaches during face-to-face -face sessions, and then when the kids, when the students are home, they undertake the homework. So the opportunity to take a look at how the students employ the skills that they learn, apply the knowledge that they have um, amassed through the classes, are actually not seen by the teachers because the homework is done at home. In the flipped classroom model, this is reversed. So the didactic portion, the learning, the listening to lectures, uh, will be done at the student's own pace through webinars. And then the learning component, when the skills and the knowledge of the student uh, are manifested in various ways, that's done during the face-to-face -face sessions with the lecturer. So our course will be designed in this way. For the internal students, the lectures, the face-to-face -face sessions are divided into two. A brief lecture, and then the rest of the time will be devoted to group work. And that's when I, as your lecturer, interact with the students, and that's where the students interact with each other. So we can actually undertake what John Hattie talks about, this idea of visible learning. For our external students, the webinars and also the face-to-face -face lectures that will be recorded later on will be viewed by the external students at their own pace and then the time or the opportunity for interaction to occur between the lecturer and the external students and among the external students will be during the discussion fora that we will be undertaking for this course. The discussion fora though will be asynchronous. That means that it won't be done in real time. It, it will be extended, it will be an extended uh, exchange and interaction section uh, among the students and the lecturer. That's the first principle, the flipped classroom. Second principle that we will be adopting for this course will be the idea of communities of practice, nurturing communities of practice. A lot of the face-to-face -face sessions and um, interaction between students and the lecture will be done in group-based activities. 
we will also be rolling out a global mentorship program where our students, internal and external, actually interact with a global mentor, an experienced leader in education from a different context who will act as uh, a sounding board, someone you can talk with uh, as you progress in the course. We'll talk about the global mentors, the global mentor program within the leadership specialization here at the School of Education as we go through the course. The kinds of leaders that we aspire to become or the ones that we hope can be produced as they go through our courses here at the School of Education at the University of Queensland is actually uh, a reflective type of leader, a reflective practitioner leader, if we could call it that. And we are actually borrowing from the tradition of Donald Sean, who talks about uh, reflective practitioner. Briefly, when we take a look at reflective practitioners, uh, what we're looking at are individuals who continually learn. So our aspiration as the designer of this course is that after you've completed this particular course in the UC7100, the seeds of continuous learning have been planted and you will engage with each other through your communities of practice with the literature in your continuing pursuit of learning about leadership. That's the third design principle. The fourth design principle is that um, we aspire that everyone participating in the course should view each other, should view me as a critical friend. This picture, essentially that would be me right here. And this individual right here, if you recognize him, is Professor Christopher Day. He is one of the leading gurus of educational leadership. I consider him a critical friend. When I write about leadership, when I publish about issues in leadership and education, I usually consult him, and he's very, very frank, very honest. He is a critical friend who is able to help me um, as I try to deepen my knowledge and expertise in educational leadership. So these are our design principles. We flip the classroom. We nurture communities of practice. We aspire to produce critical reflective practitioners and we view each other as critical friends. Let's talk briefly about your critical friend in EDU C7100. One of your critical friends is essentially me. Again, I look at the definition of Costa and Calic in relation to a critical friend. So my role in the course is to ask provocative questions. I'll provide you with data to be examined through another person's lens and I will be offering critique of your work as a friend and as an advocate for the success of that work. So let me tell you that sometimes when you receive feedback from me, particularly for your assessment tasks, you might find that it's um, really strong points that I bring up. Well, that's all because uh, I view myself as a critical friend and I offer critiques of your work, not of you as a person, but your work your outputs as a friend and as an advocate for your success. I, to tell you more about myself, I actually see myself as someone attempting to be a critical reflective practitioner. Um, this is an engagement typified by an extended critique of policy and reflections and practice. These three images you see are highlights of what preoccupy my teaching and practice. This first picture here is of me when I was still teaching um, um, in Spain. I was actually a teacher researcher in, in Spain in various cities, Barcelona, Madrid, Sevilla. Um, and one of the research insights that I obtained then that really struck me as a young individual then was the idea of sequema, a Spanish phrase which means to be burnt. Well, this is actually teacher burnout. It's a phenomenon that I continually explore and try to look for ways to, to address. 
later on, I actually became a school principal in my birthplace, which is the, the Philippines. I was a school principal for an elementary and a high school. It corresponds to a primary and a secondary school in, our, in the Australian context. And uh, as a school principal, what I discovered was the power of networks of reform because I participated in various networks of reform. So in my master's degree studies, which I pursued at the University of New South Wales, I looked at networks of reform in the United States of America, focusing on this organization called the Coalition of Essential Schools. And then when I did my PhD, I looked at how networks of reform could address a pernicious problem in my home country, corruption. So I continue to take a look at how corruption in education, and I'll explain this in subsequent webinars, um, can actually be addressed through various means, and one of the most potent means is through uh, involved and engaged stakeholders working in networks. So I continually try to be a critical reflective practitioner, and these are the three areas that I am constantly trying to deepen my knowledge, my, my expertise. Part of my scholarly work is uh, critical ethnography. Um, these are used by politically minded researchers. I am a political scientist by training. And I actually, because of my exposure to my studies on corruption, I saw that there was really a need to, to be the voice of marginalized groups. Um, the goal of my research and the goal of my teaching, I hope, is to, to change society in, in one way or the other. And I am a believer that research is value-laden. I also am an advocate of uh, challenging the status quo. Why is it so? And in terms of research, I create literal dialogue. I, I foster dialogue with participants. So my research stance is reflected in my teaching stance. I adhere to the idea of conversations, deep conversations, critical conversations with students, and in the process, we learn together. So I've spoken about the design principles. I've talked about me as your critical friend, your lecturer. Um, again, one important thing that I'd like to point out, uh, one tremendous advantage I have most of the students is that I have committed many more mistakes in teaching and research and in the area of leadership. So that's my, that's my advantage. I have made many more mistakes. Now let's take a look at the structure of our course. If you've had a chance to look at our Blackboard site and also our uh, your electronic course profiles, you will notice that the course is divided into three sections. So I'll talk about each of these sections. The first section is about one of the enduring debates in leadership, leader versus manager. So this is section one. Week one will be the welcome lecture, welcome webinar, which is what I'm doing now. For week two, we'll talk about leadership traits then and now. Week three, we'll talk about leader versus manager. And week four, we'll talk about school leadership. So those are the thematic points that we will be addressing for each week. When we take a look at the entire section, section one, the main question that I'd like you to really to reflect on from week one to week four is are those two questions that are that you can see in the screen in the slide. How do I view myself? Am I a leader or manager? So I'm actually exploring your identity, the perception that you have in relation to your identity or how you identify what a leader is. This is what we're going to explore in section one. The next big section, section two, looks at probably one of the most hotly debated issue in leadership today. And this is the idea of leadership outcomes and well-being. When we take a look at this, uh, we will be devoting three weeks of that to looking at this debate. For week five, we look at leadership and school outcomes, the first part. 
that would be the research in this area prior to the prior to the century because they established some uh, remarkable theories and then in week six we take a look at leadership and school outcomes research current day the present day which is really very different from what happened prior to that and then in week seven we take a look at the impact of leadership uh, taking into consideration the evolving theories and uh, the various studies that have been undertaken so the main question that I'd like you to reflect on for weeks five to seven in the section of leadership outcomes and well-being is a question related to the impact of leadership and really if you take a look at it really more closely what I'm trying to explore are notions of agency that you have as aspirant leaders or notions of agency that you think leaders should possess so the section one we look at uh, one of the great debates leader or manager and the leadership aspect we are exploring is the identity of leaders for section two we take a look at leadership outcomes and well-being and the concept we're looking at is agency after week seven or around week seven I'll talk to you more about the assessment task but I prepared this short video that looks at your assessment task So that particular short video that I prepared for you explains uh, what the first assessment task is, which is a literature review, a critical literature review. Uh, and here you essentially choose one aspect of um, one theory, one approach that you have encountered in sections one and two of your course. We now continue looking at the structure. We're now going to take a look at the third and, and final section of the course and this looks at 21st century leadership so it begins from week 8 until week 11 in week 8 we take a look at 21st century education week 9 we look at 21st century leadership in week 10 we look at leadership in periods of uncertainty and complexity and in week 11 we talk about critical reflective leaders the main question that I'd like you to really be reflecting on while undertaking Section 3 is how does one lead in periods of uncertainty and complexity? That, that particular question, how do you lead in these periods? The concept that we're actually trying to explore is autonomy. 
which is an essential element, essential component that leaders should possess. Um, uh, do leaders, do you think that leaders, um, that, that true leaders, according to your definition, need to be autonomous? What if leaders are not autonomous? So these are things that we will be exploring in the third section, 21st century leadership. And then I prepared also this short video that talks about the second assessment tasks. There are only two assessment tasks for this particular course. The first one that you saw earlier is a literature review, that's 40%. This second one is um, a case study, and this constitutes 60%. That's it. Those are the key aspects that um, I wanted to discuss in this general introduction to EDUC 7100. Again, to reiterate, we I spoke to you about the design principles of the course, um, and then I talked to you about briefly about me as your uh, critical friend as I facilitate the course. And then I spoke about um, the structure of the course. Essentially, there are three main structures, main debates. One is about leadership versus management. The other one is about school leadership and outcomes or the impact of leadership. And the third one is about 21st century leadership or how one can lead in periods of uncertainty and complexity. There are venues for you to be able to explore these concepts that I explained in greater detail by taking a look at the your um, electronic course profile available in Blackboard. I also prepared a detailed course outline also available in your Blackboard that describes the various aspects of our course. I invite you to start reading the literature that I have made available in the course so that we could have fruitful conversations as the weeks in the semester proceed. Thank you and see you all for our um, internal students in the face-to-face -face lectures and for our external students I hope to also see you, metaphorically see you, in the discussion fora that we will be launching uh, within this week. Thank you very much.